Hello, everyone. Welcome to Loop and Learn's T1D Speaker Series. Welcoming back Dr. Laura Nally, one of our absolute all-time favorite speakers, uh, because she lives our life, um, plus some. And she'll be talking today about uh, looping and exercise. Um, just a reminder, in case you don't remember, she is a pediatric endocrinologist at Yale University. I believe she was originally trained at Stanford, and she is a T1D, and she is a looper, and she has expertise in looping and exercise, looping in kids, uh, looping in pregnancy. Oh, what is it? She doesn't know, and she has a cute puppy. <clears throat> There you go. Um, my regular disclaimer, I think you can all see this. A loop app is a do-it-yourself closed loop algorithm. We are not giving you medical advice. We are trying to help you understand how to run your loop while you're exercising or any other questions you have. But you take full responsibility for building and running this system, and you do so at your own risk. Um, please remember, if you haven't remembered by now, loop app is not FDA approved for therapy. Uh, once again, bookmark this website. There's a ton of information. Anytime you want to build, you want to go here. Anytime you want to see about which version you have and when you need to update, mm -hmm. this is where you want to go. Sign up for the newsletter. It goes out absolutely on time pretty much every week by Carol Vashon. It's amazing. It's filled with really just critical information and um, it just drops into your mailbox. So it couldn't be any easier. Um, upcoming events. Uh, next week, we'll have Eric Verhoff from Seagrove Partners. They're a consulting firm um, in the healthcare industry specializing in diabetes. And I, agree. Um, I believe also oncology or cardiology, um, but they're particularly interested in diabetes technology. And when I explained to that who our audience was, we actually understand what's out there already for us. He said, we have some interesting research on how people with diabetes look at their devices and living with diabetes versus how healthcare professionals look at the technology and how you should live with your diabetes. He says it's really very fascinating, kind of fun and quirky information. Um, so I think that'll be just a lot of fun to listen to. And I agree, 40%. We are, we are um, in the works right now to develop a, a little three series segment. I agree, 40%. Okay, whoever's got a night. Battery, 40%. Oh, I hope that's not me. Um, we're going to listen to the kids who are young loopers. Let's, let's listen to what they have to say. We've had some experiences with younger loopers talking, and they love talking to us. So why shouldn't we give them the opportunity to tell us how they feel about things, how they manage things like eating pizza, and what they hope for in their lives. Um, we're going to try to split it into three. One is little ones, that would be maybe under the age of 10 or 11, teens, the difficult age, um, and young adults. Um, and we're working on it. We'll let you know when, but I think it'll be just absolutely adorable. If you're old enough to remember uh, Kids Say the Darndest Things with Art Linkletter, that ages me, but um, kids do say the darndest things and we'll get to listen to them. So a quick introduction about Dr. Laura Nally. She was diagnosed with type one diabetes at the age of six in 1990. Yep, you can figure out how young she is. She trained to become a pediatric endocrinologist at Stan Stanford University. And she began looping in 2018. While at Stanford, she spent eight days hiking Mount Whitney. That's impressive to me. The tallest peak in the contiguous U.S. with nine teens and two adults with T1D and went on to write about it, the first Wilner's Medical Society clinical practice guidelines. She currently works at Yale University as an assistant professor and receives funding from the National Institutes of Health to study metabolic changes that occur on very low carb diets in youth with T1D. She's also published the first case report on looping and pregnancy. Uh, we've got that up on our, um, in our files if you need to take a look at that. Uh, she spends her free time advocating to improve access and affordability to diabetes, uh, medications and supplies, serving as a legislative lead for the Connecticut uh, hashtag insulin for all chapter of T1 International, a great organization. Um, she's going to be talking today primarily about looping and exercise, but pretty much if you have questions, uh, put them in the chat, or if you're on YouTube, put them in the chat on YouTube. We're bringing over all the questions. And after Dr. Nally does her presentation, 
Will would start pitching the questions over, keep the questions going. We'll go as, as long as it's not like midnight her time. Um, my shirt, by the way, says, we'll exercise for chocolate. It looks like it says, we'll exercise for carbohydrates, but it actually says char chocolate, which is also a true statement. Anyway, I'm going to take this off and I am going to turn this over to Dr. Nally. Please welcome and thank you so much for coming back to talk to us. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I also just want to mention right now my blood sugar is uh, 66. So at the beginning, it might be a little <laughs> rocky, but it's going to smooth out because I had a few um, Skittles right here. So living with diabetes, this is how it goes. Let's see. So let me just go ahead and start the slideshow. So, um, so thank you so much for that introduction. Do y'all see the presenter screen or the regular screen? I'm sorry. We see you. The regular screen. You see the regular screen. Okay. Yeah. Just wanted to double check. Thank you. You're um, it so says exercise and T1D. That's perfect. That's exactly what it's supposed to say. <laughs> All right. So, um, so thank you guys for having me back again. Um, I, today, I really just want to talk about something that's probably been the biggest challenge for me in having diabetes, which is managing exercise and trying to keep your blood sugar stable. Um, for whatever reason, you know, diabetes is, is uh, very complicated and I've never really followed the textbook, which is where my interest in this area has come from. Um, and so, so hopefully I'll be able to share some insight with you all about um, a lot of the metabolic changes that are happening when we're exercising and the why behind the blood sugar changes that we're seeing and ways we can think about it, um, think about different types of exercise differently when we're making those insulin dose adjustments and potentially use that in loop. Okay. So, um, so there's just a brief outline and then I do, I did want to leave a lot of time for questions and answers. And so for whatever comes up, please just let me know. Um, but first I'll start out by talking a little bit about exercise physiology and some of the challenges that come up with diabetes. And then basically my top four things to think about anytime you're starting an activity or exercise. Um, and then we can kind of talk about how we can make our adjustments, um, uh, based on, based on the exercise that we're doing. So. Sometimes managing diabetes <laughs> and, um, and exercise can feel very complicated. Like you're trying to get this exactly right, but there are so many factors like insulin, um, exercise, how you're feeling, um, what you've eaten recently, your fitness level, um, a lot of hormonal things that we don't have a lot of control over and, um, and trying to balance all of these things or try to maintain stable blood sugars can be very, very tricky. So it can feel a bit overwhelming, but hopefully today um, I've simplified it in a way that's that's somewhat understandable. Um, <clears throat> so when we're thinking about our blood sugars, um, glucose is coming in from our intestines primarily. That's our main source of glucose. But the um, the other source of glucose that we have, and that's from food. The other source of glucose that we have, though, also comes from our liver. Okay, and our liver secretes glucose in response to a variety of different hormones. So these can be glucagon, um, which is also made by the pancreas, though in people with type one diabetes, sometimes the glu glucagon regulation isn't exactly doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, cortisol, so like a stress hormone, um, growth hormone, um, this can be secreted during exercise. And then in adolescents who are growing and developing that growth hormone plays a big role. And then of course, epinephrine and norepinephrine, these are the hormones that are like your fight or flight response. Um, and so these hormones not only help you exercise by raising your heart rate, and getting your, your heart to pump blood to all the different muscles in the body, but then they also um, act on the liver to release some glucose too. So we have a lot of hormonal factors that go into exercise, which is, which are some of the things that can make it a little bit trickier to manage. <clears throat> um, now glucose in your bloodstream is going to a lot of different places as well. So it's going to your brain that doesn't require any insulin. It's some of it goes back to your, um, your intestines and your stomach and digestive processes that doesn't really require insulin. Um, when you're exercising, there are both insulin dependent and then insulin independent mechanisms. So, so you can, you can get some of that glucose out of the bloodstream, um, by ways that are mediated by insulin, but also there are some independent methods as well. Um, so that you can still move around if you don't have enough insulin. 
um, storing fat. Those are little fat shells. <laughs> if you haven't seen those before, you need insulin to store fat. So, um, so that's another factor. Um, you need insulin to store glucose in your liver. So I think of the liver when I talk to kids, because you guys are getting a talk by a pediatric endocrinologist tonight. Um, the liver is like a little sugar garage. Okay. That's where you store all of your sugar is where you keep it. And then you let it out bit by bit, depending on your hormonal balance. Um, and so, so, so glucose does need to go back into the liver at some point as well. Um, and then of course, you know, if there's too much glucose in your bloodstream, your kidneys are then going to excrete it, um, in your urine. Okay. They're going to filter it out and say, you know what, we don't need this extra glucose. We're just going to, we're just going to get rid of it that way. And that does not necessarily require insulin. So, um, so, and, and this is not all inclusive, obviously glucose is used in other things too, but this is just kind of a general idea to get you started on where's the insulin going or where is the glucose going and when does it need insulin and when does it not? So getting a little bit into exercise physiology, when we're thinking about an activity that we're going to do, generally um, I'll break it into terms of, is this an aerobic activity or is this more an, of an anaerobic activity or is it kind of like a high intensity um, activity? So if we're doing aerobic um, activities like walking, hiking, running, bicycling, swimming, glucose is gonna be used differently than if we're doing anaerobic activities or high intensity activities. Okay. Anaerobic activities are going to be things like resistance training and weightlifting, and then high intensity interval training. If you guys have ever done that, where you do a brief period of intense exercise, where you really get your heart rate up and then you have like little rest periods in between, um, that's going to, it's going to affect your blood sugar levels in different ways. So the first step that I think about is kind of breaking it down into what kind of activity, um, we're thinking about. Um, and this diagram shows you a little bit about how you might expect, expect your blood sugar levels to change depending on the activity. So first in our aerobic category, um, it, it does depend on like how long you're exercising and the intensity level that you're exercising at, but blood sugars tend to, to trend downward. Um, if you're doing more aerobic, the mixed activities, these are more like sports where you might be moving for a little while and then sort of stopping or running for a little bit and then maybe not moving as much. Um, you can kind of have high intensity um, intervals mixed in with, uh, with more aerobic activity. And so, um, so in these activities, sometimes your blood sugar will go up and sometimes it'll go down. So it can be a little bit more confusing about what might happen or it may just stay stable and everything will sort of balance itself out. Um, and then the third category is, is anaerobic, um, where we might actually see our blood sugar levels rise. Um, and that's in response to some of the hormones that are being released, um, and th th that, that will actually release, um, glucose from your liver. So, um, <clears throat> so this does say children with diabetes, but it, but it applies to adults too. Um, so. If you don't have diabetes, what your body does is it's going to decrease the amount of insulin that you're making um, when you start exercising, because it can do that really quickly. <laughs> and and in, unlike in diabetes where you take injections and the insulin kind of hangs out in your fat as it slowly gets absorbed into the bloodstream, when you're... Um, when you don't have diabetes, you can just make a little bit of insulin and then stop making it. And then basically the insulin levels will come down very quickly. So, um, so if you don't have diabetes, you're going to decrease your insulin and increase the counter-regulatory hormones that you're making. Those are the ones that, that are going to help you get, um, glu glucose into your bloodstream from your liver. And, um, and it's just going to try to match everything to keep your blood sugar stable. So the decrease in insulin and the increase in these other hormones that release more glucose, are going to be what balances it. Um, and so, so there's insulin mediated and, and non-insulin mediated mechanisms as well. Um, but these glucose receptors on the top of your muscles are basically just chewing up all the glucose from your bloodstream. Um, and they chew up more glucose if you tend to have more insulin around. So with, with really intense exercise, like if you're doing something like a sprint, um, epinephrine and norepinephrine, and then other, um, counter regulatory hormones like cortisol and growth hormone. Those are our four friends that raise our blood sugar today that will be mentioned over and over again. Um, 
tend to act on the liver and make you release more glucose. Okay. So in those activities, sometimes we'll see blood sugars go up. Um, the other thing that happens in those in anaerobic activities or high intensity activities is, um, you make lactate because it's like so intense that you just don't have, um, enough of the substrates around to metabolize it in an aerobic way. So, so you end up making lactate and that actually can circulate around and, and be turned into glucose again as well. So these are some factors that can raise your blood sugar. Um, so, so we're going to see higher gl liver glucose production. And then you may see like, if you don't have diabetes, there'll be like a slight rise in your glucose levels. Um, but it could be long lasting if you're somebody with type one diabetes, unless you give insulin later. I just want to pause right there to see, does anybody have any questions about stuff that's come up so far? I think we're good. Just keep going and then we'll figure out what we think you heard you say. Okay. <laughs> Doing my best. Thank you. Okay. So in type one diabetes, we gave insulin, we injected it under the skin and it, kind of, it lingers, right? It doesn't just go away. It lingers for a while. So you can't take back what you've already given. So a lot of our modifications around exercise are going to be, well, how can we, how can we like reduce the insulin that we're going to give in the future? And how can we give carbohydrates to make it so that we don't have like a low blood sugar during exercise? Um, and part of that is, be, is, is um, and I'll, I'll tell you a couple of reasons why this, this may be happening. So, so we can't get rid of the insulin that we've already given. Okay. The other thing that happens is let's say, you know, you gave an injection in your thigh and you're doing a lot of squats or you're like running or something like that. The amount of blood that's circulating to that area is going to increase and it can actually raise the amount of insulin levels that, that your body's seeing at that time. Cause it's just getting that insulin to circulate a little more effectively. So, so that can, then the higher insulin levels means your blood sugar could drop more. So, so that's one thing that can happen. Um, and then the other thing is, is that, um, your, your muscles are going to be able to take up more glucose with that, with that insulin around. So hypoglycemia is definitely something that we want to look out for, um, cause that can occur during, or even soon after exercise. The other issue that comes up is those counter-regulatory hormones that we talked about, the epinephrine and the norepinephrine, and these are like same thing as adrenaline. If you've heard that term, um, the things that raise your blood sugars don't always do it in a predictable way like they do if you don't have diabetes, because this is, this is just how it is. <laughs> so, um, so, so, so risk of hypoglycemia is always, always a big deal in exercise and something that we definitely want to counsel folks on a lot. Okay. All right. So this, um, this is a diagram that also, I, I like this diagram better because I think it includes everything kind of in one picture, but, um, but basically what it's showing is that activities along the top are going to be the ones that are, are more likely to raise your blood sugar. Okay. And these are, and the more intense then the more likely it is to raise your blood sugar. And then as we turn to more, and these, these are more anaerobic activities, as we get to more aerobic activities, like the jogging and the cycling, um, then more sustained activities or the longer you, you have, you exercise, then the more likely it is that your blood sugars are going to drop over time. Okay. So this, this kind of gives us a good idea of, okay, which way are we going to go if we're going to start this activity? And then if we're doing it longer, like say more than 20 minutes, then, oh, then that's a higher risk that our blood sugars are going to drop. Um, whereas if it's more intense, then maybe that's a higher risk that our blood sugars are going to go up. Okay. So, so then, so when we've got our activity picked out, the, the next thing I usually like to think about is, is how much insulin do we have on board? So if we, we, so I assume most folks here are on some sort of looping device or, or, um, or closed loop system. Our best guess is these are loopers. Yeah. Or their kids are loopers. Yes. So, um, so what we want to think about, it, honestly, the, the key to, to this, um, I think, is really looking at your insulin on board when you start an activity and, and when your last insulin dose was given. Okay. So if you're, if you're, if you've recently given insulin, um, and I'm going to repeat this later, so you're going to hear it again. If you've recently given insulin then, and you have more insulin on board, that insulin is going to more effectively lower your blood sugars during activity. So the more insulin you have on board, 
even if you're doing a more intense activity or say you're doing weightlifting, you're like, oh, but that's anaerobic. If you have more insulin on board, it's there's more potential that it's going to lower your blood sugars. Okay. Regardless of the activity that you're doing. Okay. So always thinking about that ahead of time and trying to figure out what's, what's your like sweet spot for the insulin on board when you're exercising, depending on the activity can be really helpful. Um, so most activities lasting more than 30 minutes are likely going to mean that you need to reduce your insulin dose, um, sometime prior to the exercise or increase your carbohydrate intake to try to keep your blood sugar stable. Now, who wants to hear more about hormones? Cause if, if you get excited about hormones, <laughs> I've got the best slide for you. Um, all right. I really wanted to put this out here because I think it's very interesting. I don't know if anybody has ever experienced, um, cause this was an issue for me that no doctors could ever tell me what was going on, but has anybody ever had like the post-exercise spike in their blood sugars where your blood sugars are just like high for a long time? And you're like, what the heck? Like, why do it like, and, and I've had to like double my normal insulin doses to get it down. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. I just exercised. Why is this happening to me? <laughs> it's very frustrating. So there's a lot of sneaky hormones that are trying to raise your blood sugar. <laughs> um, and, and those are a lot of times what is doing it. So, so I, I have this graph right here. Basically, these are people with diabetes that they had exercise at different intensity levels. And then they looked at the hormones that they were making. This is just a beautiful study. Like, I wish I could have been a part of it. But, but what we see in the top left on A is their insulin levels. So they kept their insulin levels very stable. Hold on. I've got some chat stuff. We talk about post-exercise, but it's better to exercise before we're, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a little bit. Okay. So the first one is A, where we have our insulin levels, where we kept them pretty much stable in each of these exercise activities. And what they did, this is the hormonal response to exercise in young adults that were doing 35% of their VO2 max or their maximum oxygen um, like metabolism capacity, um, 50%, 65%, and 80%. 80%, you're really getting up there. You're like working super hard. So, um, so the insulin levels were stable throughout. Um, they looked at how glucagon levels changed in people with type one diabetes. And what ended up happening is the glucagon levels didn't change very much. Okay. If you don't have diabetes, the glucagon tends to go up. It's like, oh, your blood sugars are going to drop. I'm going to try to help you. Not as helpful if you have type one. Um, epinephrine and norepinephrine both rose during activities, but it depended on how intense they were. So the red and the yellow are the more intense activities. So during the exercise itself, um, and basically this little black line down here is when the exercise is happening. So during the exercise itself, your epinephrine and your norepinephrine levels both went up and those, those are raising your heart rate and helping you pump blood to all of your muscles. Um, but they're also potentially raising your blood sugar as well. Okay. Um, and so that's what we're showing here in these two photos, but then at the end of exercise, they drop back down because your heart rate's recovering. You're coming back down to normal they're, they're going to like get out of your system and not cause you more trouble. Now, um, growth hormone levels also kind of went up. And, it, and so the growth hormone levels we see increased as the activity went on. And then once it stopped, they, they kind of more slowly went away, but usually by about an hour later, your growth hormone levels had kind of gone back down to a lower level. Um, but cortisol, cortisol is sneaky um, because it actually goes up. It, it went up even more in the more intense activities and it hung around for, for quite a long time. So it wasn't really until two hours that it really got completely out of your system. And so what I've seen, I, I've seen anywhere um, from, from these hormones hanging out for like two to four hours post-activity causing hyperglycemia. It's not always that the hormone is like elevated during that time, but its effects can continue to last longer. So you may see anywhere from two to four hours post-exercise, you have this like really stubborn high that like you just can't get down. And a lot of this is related to these hormonal responses. Let me see. Thoroughly explain the insulin on board time frames. I can talk a little bit more about that. That's we we have some slides on the insulin and stuff. Okay. Um, so this, so basically when you're thinking about the type of exercise, there's different hormones that are going to be released for different types of exercise. So if we're thinking moderate aerobic exercise, this this chart just kind of talks about how people with diabetes, with type one diabetes or people without diabetes, 
um, ha- see differences in their glucose responses. Um, and so, so without changing insulin, you know, people with diabetes may have a small increase in glucagon, but maybe not. Um, you'll see a, an increase in their adrenaline, um, a small increase in the amount of, uh, amount of, uh, glucose that they're secreting for their liver. And most of the time the blood sugar is going to decrease. Okay. Um, then if you're doing like a maximal 10 second sprint, if you have type one diabetes or you don't have type one diabetes, things are very similar. Um, the, the outcomes are very similar. So it's not that different, um, in both cases. Is there anything you can do to get cortisol out of body? Not that I know of maybe like meditation or something like, like I honestly, um, it's just like a stress hormone that we don't, it's hard to control. Growth hormone is also a growth hormone goes up and down, like all the time, all day long. Like you can't, there, there's just no way to, to really control those things. Um, so, so, so being kind on yourself, if you're like, okay, these are stubborn high after activity, but there's a lot of things that, that aren't necessarily out of my control. Hydration. Yes. So hydration can help you clear lactate. Okay. And sometimes if you have a lot of lactate buildup, that lactate can turn into glucose. So making sure that you're staying hydrated. Um, sometimes if you've done like a really intense activity, just like, you know, sitting on a bike for like 10 or 15 minutes to flush out the lactate can help just like easy, easy, light exercise to help get rid of it. That can be, that can be helpful. Yes. Great question. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so when we're preparing for exercise, um, uh, so I don't know if, any, if, if you're parents of children with diabetes, most of the studies are going to be done on adults. Um, there's a few studies in children, but I'm just putting it out there that a lot of these recommendations were just sort of applying to kids because they haven't been studied and we don't have any data on them. Um, but I also just want to mention individual responses to exercise will vary. They'll vary by day. And they'll, they'll vary by exercise and by time, all sorts of things. Um, but we really got to individualize everything. And in your, honestly, you will be the person who's most knowledgeable about what happens to you during exercise. Um, and, and hopefully I can explain some of the, the most important things to look at. So, um, so I think y'all, y'all all seem pretty savvy. You, you know, um, you're going to have like your glucose testing supplies, your, your rapid, um, acting hypoglycemia treatment, your water and your electrolytes, insulin, insulin, glucagon in case of emergencies. If you have blood ketone test strips, um, I, I really, I really highly recommend these because I mean, they're not covered by all insurances, depending on the state that you're in. It's a whole, whole thing. But, um, but if you do have access to them and they're not like prohibitively expensive, um, I definitely think, uh, it's a good idea to have them to get a real time assessment of what your ketone levels are. Um, always having a diabetes ID bracelet is a good idea. Um, and then extra supplies, your cell phone, all those sorts of things. You're going to have your cell phone cause you're looping for the most part. Um, we, we have a whole section on eating and blood sugars and how to adjust insulin doses and things like that. So I will get to that shortly. Okay. Um, if weight management is, is what you're going for, I just want to briefly mention that you want to focus on reducing your insulin levels instead of like ingesting extra carbohydrates. Um, whereas if you're more doing like a competitive sport, you want to focus more on your nutritional needs and make sure you're getting those all, all in because, um, because it's like a different goal, right? You're trying to build muscle, build up everything. So you want to make sure that you're eating plenty to meet all of the goals and make sure you have energy to do all the things you want to do. And if you're trying to, um, work on weight management, you know, like four juice boxes during an exercise is not going to be ideal <laughs> for, for helping with that. The best glucose form. I mean, I think, uh, you know, that that's, I think that's a, a very individual decision. You want rapid acting carbohydrates. Um, I tend to go for juice boxes personally, liquids are easily absorbed from your, your, um, your GI tract. So it'll just go through more smoothly. Um, but you know, anything rapid acting that you have, like I had some Skittles before we started that, that worked pretty well. I'm now 86. So, you know, um, but I think anything, the things that are most easily absorbed are best glucose tablets are great. Those kind of like disintegrate in your mouth. Some may get absorbed in your cheeks and stuff like that too. Um, so, so yeah. Um, we will, um, I'll, I'll address some of the more individual questions at the end. Let me just go ahead and get through. So I just want to talk about the primary factors to consider when you're, when you're doing an activity. So first is it the type intensity and duration of the activity. What am I doing? How long am I doing it for those types of things? 
Um, you want to know your blood glucose concentration before exercise and, and your CGM trend arrows. You guys probably all know this because because you're you're looping and things like that, but kind of keeping track of that. Now, the next thing is um, the insulin on board. So what, uh, I mean, insulin on board is calculated differently depending on what device you are using. However, I would say if you have a consistent means of measuring that insulin on board, I would stick to whatever your means are. Um, because, because I, I don't know what the magic number is for insulin on board, like, like how many units are, are in your system right now and how that's going to affect your blood sugar. But I know that looking at that number before, during, and after exercise can help you figure out like, oh, when I have one unit on board, I don't drop too much when I do aerobic act or when I do like, you know, high intensity interval training and I stay pretty stable. Maybe that's like a, an okay level to start at. Whereas if I have six units on board and that's just what it says, you know, like on your device, if you have six units on board and you notice you drop, then, then maybe that, that that's too much. So it's really just individualizing what does your IOB say and comparing that to what's happening during the activity. It's just something to pay attention to that can help you figure out what the best, um, what, what you can tolerate during exercise and it can help direct you on what you need to do. Um, oh, we have a, a pro tip here. Use um, juice boxes, but found that mixing um, elevate 15 glucose powder in one ounce of water delivers 15 of grams grams of carbs quickly. I use a bottle like Suja liquid shots. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you. All right. And then, um, and then of course there's, there's, if you have some insulin on board, but you also just ate a meal, that's, that's, um, it's less to worry about because that insulin is also covering the meal that you're eating, right. That you just ate and it is digesting. So then I would say that's going to play less of a role. How does fatigue spend? I do not exactly know how fatigue affects hormone responses with exercising. Those are great questions. I, I don't have an answer to that though, unfortunately. Y'all are going to have, you're, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be like stump, stump Laura and Allie tonight, which is fine because there's so much we don't know. Okay. So, um, so one practical thing about CGMs is, um, and granted this is an older study and it was done on a Dexcom G4. More recent data shows that there's not as much of a lag time between what your CGM value is showing you and what your actual value is during exercise. But anytime your blood sugars are changing rapidly, the CGM is not going to be as accurate. Okay. So what, what they did in this study is they looked at um, CGM values during exercise and then actual like gold standard capillary glucose values during exercise. And they compared the two. Okay. And so the dotted line is the CGM values. And, um, and the solid line up here is, is the YSI. That's like the gold standard of glucose. Okay. They also have, um, the blood sugars that they checked through like a capillary blood sugar check. And those are like a slightly different dotted line. But, um, but I just want to show you that the CGM values are down here. Um, and the actual values are up here. So the CGM was lagging behind the actual glucose levels during the activity. The blood sugars went up pretty quickly. And then here we are later on, we had, we did this hit activity for zero to 15 minutes. And then by 60 minutes, it had sort of caught up and figured out where the blood sugars were at. So, so, so anytime the blood sugars are changing rapidly, you might not necessarily get an accurate reading from your CGM. So always go based on like your own feelings and you can always do an extra like blood sugar check in the middle of exercise. If you feel like it's, if you're dropping or rising really quickly. Okay. Um, this shows the negative bias of 35 milligrams per deciliter. You're off by 35. That's, that's quite a bit, you know? So, um, so it's something you just be aware of. Um, and it has been shown to overestimate glucose values um, during aerobic exercise because it just hasn't quite caught up to what your glucose levels are. Okay. Um, prior to exercise, the, the, so these are um, recommendations. These are the pediatric diabetes recommendations, but as it turns out, oops, they're very, very similar to the adult recommendations. <laughs> so since they're pretty, they're pretty much exactly the same, except for, for one slight difference that I don't think is really um, contributory. So I'm going to put these up because this diagram was easier to interpret than the adult recommendations. But basically they're saying, these are just general recommendations. Let's say you're new to exercise. You're not quite sure what your body does yet. 
Okay. If you're less than 90, consider 10 to 20 grams of carbohydrates. Um, and then they say delay exercise until you're at least 90 milligrams per deciliter. Um, of course, if you exercise a lot and you know, your body, I'm, I'm, these are more for recommendations. If you're like starting fresh and you're not quite sure what to do, or maybe you've run into issues and you just want to like start over. Um, 90 to 124, they say, if you're doing aerobic exercise, you might want some extra carbohydrates to try and help you. Um, if you're 126 to 180, the general recommendation is you don't need any carbohydrates. Um, 182 to 252, you can also start activity, you may consider insulin at that point, um, especially if you're going to do some anaerobic activity or, um, or high intensity. And then also if you're greater than 252 to check ketone levels as well, um, because uh, if the ketone levels are very high, sometimes they can go even higher during exercise. Um, it's just a sign that you're burning fat, but the general recommendations are, uh, that if your ketone levels are too high, it's not always a good idea to start exercise. Okay. Um, insulin on board. Now this is, this is one of the most important things. So, so when I say like, if you have, so prior to activity, you want to think about the insulin that you have on board. And so if you're in a high insulin state, a high insulin state is going to be the, the simplified version is within two to three hours of your last insulin dose. Um, so, so you took a dose for a meal, it's within two to three hours. That's going to be considered a high insulin state, whereas a low insulin state is going to be like a fasting state or like at least three hours after your last insulin dose. Obviously, if you're looping, your basal rates may have changed. Like you may have have an increase in your basal and then you do have some extra insulin on board. So, so that's why I think looking at that insulin on board number is the best thing to do when taking into account, um, how you're going to respond to activity. It, um, it, there, there's, there's a little tweak though that I want to let you know about. Okay. So insulin is going to work. Uh, insulin has its greatest effect. The rapid acting insulin has its greatest effect between like around 60 to 90 minutes after you've taken it. Okay. So, so that's when it's going to be peaking or bringing your blood sugars down the most. So if you remember when was the last time I took an insulin dose, if you're within 20 minutes of when you took insulin, you're probably not going to drop for the next like 30 or 40 minutes. So you might be in an okay place to do a short amount of exercise, but you better know, Oh, in the future, my blood sugars might start dropping, you know? Whereas, um, if you're, if you're starting activity an hour after you took that insulin dose, it's going to be most effective at that time. And you might drop more precipitously than you would if it's at least like two or three hours after that dose. You want and, to do dinner, sweetie. Oh, yes. Dinner yes. sounds good. Um, so anyway, so in these graphs, yeah. what I have is, is basically it, it's regular insulin and, um, humalog insulin. It kind of shows how quickly the, the humalog insulin will, will work, um, and then sort of goes away. Um, it works very quickly and then it starts to go away. Um, but when it's at this peak or this high point, that's when the insulin levels are highest. And that's also when it's going to be lowering your blood sugars the most. Okay. And again, it, insulin absorption can be affected by so many different things, but around 60 to 90 minute window would be the time frame where I would be like, okay, I'm going to be dropping a lot. So maybe I want to supplement with a lot of extra carbs. Um, if that's about how long it's been since I took, took my dose. Um, we're going to, and, and I'm going to talk about how we can lower this insulin on board. If you're having issues where you're eating 60 to 80 grams of carbs for free. Yeah. That that's me at the gym sometimes. Um, but, but we'll discuss some, some, some ways to do that. Um, so again, high insulin state within one to two hours of that insulin dose, when it's peaking, that's when you're at highest risk of low blood sugars. So if you can adjust when you're going to eat prior to exercise, that can be helpful. Like, okay. Or if you have a, have something before you're going to exercise that isn't high in carbohydrates and doesn't require a large dose of insulin that can also be helpful. So maybe you eat your lunch, you include your high carbs there, but then maybe, you know, an hour or two before you go to the gym, you have kind of like a high protein, low carb snack because you don't really want to have to take a whole bunch of extra insulin when you're going to go in and then, um, and it's going to drop more. Um, and then the low insulin state is going to be either fasting or at least three hours since your last bolus then you'll be at less risk of hypoglycemia. Okay. <laughs> it's very kind. Um, 
So, so when we're at, we have a high insulin state or more insulin on board, consider more aggressive basal rate reduction, more carbohydrate intake prior to the activity. If it's aerobic or if it's going to be long lasting, if you're in a low insulin state, consider a less aggressive basal rate reduction. Maybe you don't need to do anything. You know, maybe you don't need to take any carbohydrates. Maybe you can just start exercise. Um, it'll, it'll depend a little bit on which ac- exercise it is. Right. But the high insulin states are always going to be more likely to lower your blood sugars. Um, and, um, and adjusting like when the last time is you take that meal bolus before you go exercise. Okay. So, so my pro tip is pay attention to your individual level of insulin on board at the start of activity. And during the activity, note the trends in the insulin on board and how those correlate with your activity and your blood sugars. Um, and then create custom overrides in loop to help prevent hypo and hyperglycemia. So, um, so here's where we get to some of the, the pro tips. Um, so there was a study, this was on open loop patients, but I think it's also very applicable to those who are on closed loop systems. Um, so reducing your basal rate prior to exercise. So again, what can we do to help prevent this hypoglycemia during exercise so that we don't have to drink four juice boxes um, during activity? One is when is our last big dose of insulin before we start the activity? Try to push that two hours ahead. That's going to be the biggest bang for, for your buck, um, honestly, because that's going to be a lot more insulin than your basal rate is. Okay. Any mealtime bolus is going to be a lot more. Um, but you can do, um, a pre-exercise basal rate reduction or one of your custom overrides that you can kind of tweak to be like 80% of what your normal doses are, or 60% of what your normal doses are, depending on what your needs are. And so when they did this study, um, this was 17 adults using a pump, they did several different basal rate reductions. So they did an 80% basal rate reduction, 90 minutes prior to the exercise, they did a 50% basal rate reduction 90 minutes prior. And then the other group just took off their pump when they started the exercise or they suspended it. Right. So, and that's the circle. Okay. So the folks who dropped the most are the folks that just took off their pump during exercise. Granted, everybody started a little bit in the hyperglycemic side. I think they sort of knew people were going to exercise. Um, and they made sure everybody, their last dose of insulin was lunchtime and they didn't come in to do the study until 3 PM. See how they made that three hour window so that that lunchtime insulin wouldn't affect them here. Um, so if we did an 80% basal rate reduction, 90, 90 minutes prior to exercise, um, that group actually started out a little bit on, uh, on the lower side, but they actually trended pretty well and they didn't end up here. We are at the end, like 210 minutes out. They ended up a little bit higher than where they started, but not by much. They started out around like 160, 170, and they kind of ended out around like maybe 170, 180, something like that. So thinking 90 minutes ahead of time, reducing that basal rate by 80% helped a lot of people. Okay. So it's going to help attenuate that drop. The folks who the folks who, who just took off their pump at the beginning of exercise, they dropped down quite a bit. They started around like 170, they dropped down to 100. And then you know, eventually then they had a meal and then they went back up and things like that. Um, there's also this group that did the 50%, maybe 80% seems like a lot. Um, you could do a 50% basal rate reduction. They tended to, um, start out a little bit higher. Um, but then they came down to 150. So, so at the end of activity, here's where everybody is. Um, uh, so let's see. This slide is just to point out how much variability there is. So what is this slide showing us? It's, so this is going to show us the change in glucose based on what type of basal rate reduction they did 90 minutes prior. Okay, 80%, 50%, or we didn't do anything over here in the pump suspension group. So what happened to our change in glucose? So this is each individual person. Some people went up, some people went down. Okay. Everybody is different. And if, I mean, it is just so amazing to me how like you can do the same thing with all these different people, but different things happen to everybody. And you're kind of like giving them the same activity to do. It's an individual thing. So you really have to individualize it to what happens to you, not to me or somebody else. Um, so that's why paying attention to your unique differences is going to be important because some people's blood sugars go up and some people's blood sugars go down a lot. It's just, it's incredible. So anyways, this person actually started at 184 and dropped 125. I mean, like that's, that's very, um, a person's very insulin sensitive, but then on pump suspension, they didn't drop, they dropped a similar amount. It looks like, so they were having, uh, having some issues with that. I think they're, they might have some, some issues that need more working out. 
Okay. So the other thing to think about is um, what time is our, our activity? So if our activity is um, in the late afternoon or evening time, uh, we're going to want to also keep an eye on our blood sugars overnight. And because um, you're at higher risk of low blood sugars, if you exercise in the late afternoon or evening. So maybe a bedtime, um, you want to have, you want to reduce your basal rate. You have another program that you can use for that, a custom override where you could reduce it by 20%. And then, and then you can just feel a little bit more comfortable overnight. Um, if there are folks who are on like control IQ or something like that, I will tell them, oh, use exercise mode overnight so that it sets a higher target for you so that you don't have hypoglycemia. If you're ever worried about hypoglycemia and you use the control IQ system, just put yourself in exercise mode. It's, it's a nice way to just up your target and it'll give you less insulin. It's great. Um, so when they did this study and then they looked at their overnight glucose, they basically, um, most people were able to stay euglycemic, um, 50% basal rate reduction and 80% basal rate reduction. There was a slight increase in hypoglycemia. If you just suspended your pump at the onset of activity and less so if you did these basal rate reductions, but that's what they wanted to look at. Um, but regardless of that, you're, you're still going to be at higher risk of low blood sugars, um, overnight. Oh, the automotive automatic bolus. You could, you could leave, you could leave the automatic bolus on. Um, if you, you, okay. So the question is if you use loop with an automatic bolus and tend to spike, would you leave automatic bolus on for overnight? Um, I mean, you could, you could, honestly, I'm, I'm all about the custom overrides. I'm all about the, let's set a, a higher target overnight. If we're worried about going low. Um, so like leaving it on and letting it kind of figure out, like I'm only going to need 80% of my usual insulin doses so that it, when it does do the automatic bolus, it's not going to be giving you as much that, that, that would, I really take advantage of the custom overrides. I know some people aren't fans, but, but, um, I think it simplifies things. Oops. This is an important slide. So our blood sugars are high after exercise. We didn't go low. <laughs> Yay. We made it through. Um, what's your optimal correction factor post-exercise? So, so then there's a lot of debate because, because technically after exercise, you're more insulin sensitive a lot of the time and you may need less insulin, but let's say you did something like a high, um, intensity interval training and, um, and you know, your blood sugars are high after exercise. You basically, they, they looked at different doses of corrections that you could give to correct the high blood sugar. And they said that hundred percent of your usual, um, correction bolus is safe. Okay. So if you have high blood sugars after exercise, they do think that hundred percent of the correction bowl is to say, again, if you go low <laughs> after that, don't, don't do that, you know, like reduce it because you have to individualize it to you, but at least in this study, and this again was, um, was adults, but, um, but they did think that hundred percent of that was fine. You're, I, I see a lot of other studies that say, oh no, post-exercise, you want to reduce it by up to 50%. So, um, so different, different folks will tell you different things and you just have to figure out what works out best for you. Um, let me see if there's something in the chat. Hold on. Okay. So we have, we have, so something that works for somebody who does 45 to 120 minute sessions at 80% max heart rate on a bicycle um, before exercise, um, low or no food two to four hours before start, light exercise to bring insulin on board down um, while you're waiting for it to come down. Um, at the start of exercise, turn closed loop off and start normal basal rate. During exercise, regulate blood sugar with glucose tabs and dried fruit snacks. Lie to loop and don't tell it about carbs. Oh, I never tell loop about carbs during exercise. Please don't. I mean, some people do. I, I, I try not to because I'm one of those people that are at risk of low blood sugars. Um, uh, 20 to 30 minutes before end of exercise, bolus to bring insulin on board back to normal and slightly high. Wait until 20 to 30 minutes after exercise to turn loop back on. Enter enough carbs or add bolus to start loop with a zero trend. Your mileage may vary. <laughs> That's very cool. Thank you. Um, oh, hunger hormones. Okay. Yes, we can, we can discuss that. Let me, um, so I'm going to go back to just trying to get through this and then I'll go back to questions in a little bit. Okay. Hypoglycemia. Um, so of course you should always treat hypoglycemia if you're symptomatic, no matter what your blood sugar says, um, 
or if you're unable to do a blood sugar check. Um, so during 60 minutes of moderate aerobic activity, they say drinking something that's like six to 8% glucose solution <laughs> at a rate of carbohydrates is around one gram of carbohydrate per kilo of body weight. Take your regular body weight in pounds, divide by 2.2. So for every hour, it's about one gram of carbohydrate for, um, per kilogram of body weight that you'll need during the activity, just in general, um, from, from general exercise physiology. Um, so that might be able to help you prevent, um, having your blood sugar drop. And that's as if you have like a lot of insulin on board, or let's say like, um, you didn't make any adjustments prior to exercise, this would be, this would be something that, um, that you could, you could potentially do. Okay. Um, a little bit about meals before and after exercise. So, um, so insulin adjustments pre-exercise. So these are the, uh, if, if you have, uh, these are the pediatric recommendations they are a little bit different than adult. Um, but they're looking at two different types of activity. They're saying either continuous, moderate to vigorous, um, aerobic activities like jogging, running, swimming, bicycling, cross country, or, or other things. Um, and then comparing that to mixed aerobic and anaerobic activities like hopping, skipping, dance, gymnastics, tag, dodgeball, field, team sports, those sorts of things. Um, the meal before exercise, if the activity is going to last 30 to 45 minutes, you may want to reduce your bolus prior to the activity by 25 to 50%. Um, if it's going to be more aerobic, and then you may want to reduce by 25% if it's going to be more um, mixed and anaerobic and aerobic. Okay. Um, if it's lasting greater than 45 minutes, we need more of an insulin reduction. The longer the activity, the more likely it is that it can lower your blood sugars. So you could do a 50% bolus reduction. Um, if it's anaerobic and consider up to 75% bolus reduction, if it's aerobic and then the meal after exercise, they say up to a 50% bolus reduction because you're going to be more insulin sensitive post activity. That's especially in, um, in aerobic. Um, in pediatrics though, whether it's this mixed anaerobic and aerobic or not, they usually say to do a, a 50% bolus reduction. Okay. Not always the case for adults. So, um, in adults, um, this is, this is also pre-insulin, um, dosing for exercise, um, based on the exercise duration, this is all aerobic that we're talking about, um, but, uh, except for, we do talk a little bit about intense aerobic or anaerobic, where we say like, you don't need a reduction necessarily for 30 minutes of that activity. But, um, but if you have aerobic activity for 30 minutes, you could reduce it by 25, 50 or 75%, depending on, um, how vigorous it is. And if it's going to be a 60 minute activity, um, they only have recommendations for mild and moderate, um, of 50 and 75%. And so this is like the pre, um, the pre-exercise insulin dosing, um, before exercise. And here they say within 90 minutes of consumption of the meal. So, all right. Um, so again, we've discussed that you can, you can have elevated insulin sensitivity after exercise. So if we're not familiar with what happens to us, we're always going to want to err on the side of safety and try to reduce like a potentially a big drop in blood sugar or hypoglycemia, um, and, and reduce that, that post-exercise insulin bolus. But if we've done this a few times and we've noticed, Hey, every time after exercise, I'm high. And if I give half, I go higher. Don't do that anymore. Okay. Um, you want to just adjust your regimen to, to whatever you need. Um, eat a low glycemic index snack at bedtime, also snacks high in protein or fat. Those tend to, um, break down more slowly overnight and turn to glucose. And so that can actually help prevent, um, your overnight hypoglycemia. Sometimes we'll even say like a complex carb snack with like some fat or protein, like crackers and peanut butter is great. Um, you could do even like, you can even do like an apple and peanut butter. Um, if you're really worried about hypoglycemia, some ice cream with a lot of fat in it is like fantastic because that's really going to help keep you stable overnight. Um, and then there's the other thing you can do is you can consider a basal rate reduction, um, at night by like 20%, um, if you had afternoon or early evening activities. Okay. Okay. One thing I want to know, it sounds like a lot of folks here are, um, have done a lot of physical activity, which is awesome. And I'm so happy. Um, if you're, if you're starting a new fitness program, it's kind of different from your usual activity. Let's say, oh, I always do cycling and now I'm going to go do something like weightlifting. Um, 
you may end up using more of your glycogen stores for that new activity that you're doing um, compared to somebody who, who may be more adept at that particular activity. Okay. So that means that you might need more glucose during and after the exercise because you're just going to be using up more. But what we see people um, who are at a pretty good fitness level and like have done something for a while, they may see a greater drop in their glucose during exercise. This may be because they're more efficiently using great, bigger muscle groups, things like that, or they, they, they have a higher overall workload. But, um, but these are some of the trends that we've seen from, from some of the studies. Okay. Let me stop there for a second and just see. Um, I think it's interesting. Uh, we have some, some people on who obviously are intense exercisers. Yes. Um, I would just guess by the names that I saw as participants, that's not the majority. Um, and they're also different age groups. So they're, they're parents with kids who are exercising and also dealing with hormones. And then they're less intense, but regular exercisers. So half an hour to an hour, Pilates, paddle boarding, something like that. Nice. Nice. Very cool. Um, a lot of folks have kind of like, uh, 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 for some of the individual questions, I'd, I'd like to save those for the end. So I'll just go ahead and keep going. Does that sound good? Absolutely. Okay. We're almost there, y'all. Thanks for listening to me talk for so long. Okay. Other factors. Okay. So practice versus performance. I get to use a real world example today because, um, because I don't know does it, it, if maybe other people in here do CrossFit. I don't know if anybody did the CrossFit Open last, last week or is doing it this weekend or on Monday, but regardless, that's what I do for fun. So, um, so training and practice may result in more lowering of your glucose levels, but when it's time for like games or a performance activity, um, and this is true of kids too, practices, our blood sugars are always dropping. We have a game and we are so full of adrenaline and excited and like ready to get out there that our blood sugars start going up. So, um, so if you notice that with your kids, or if you notice that yourself, when you're, um, competing, then, um, then, then it's definitely a good idea to, um, to be aware of that because you may need more insulin on board when you start an activity, if you're going to a game, not so, you know, not so much that, that you're going to be worried about hypoglycemia, but, but my real world example, oh, hopefully it'll show. There we go. Um, this is me going to the gym from five to seven on Wednesday and where my blood sugar stayed. And then they pop up afterwards because that's just what they do. Um, but, but this is me during my typical practice. And then here's me when we did the CrossFit open, we started warming up at six o'clock. I already got really excited and my blood sugar started to rise. And then they just continued to go up and up and up and up. And it took a while for them to come back down. But I just wanted to share that with you all because, um, because that was my real life example from this week. There's a comment in here, um, that one gram per kilo uh, per hour of carbohydrates can be too much for recreational activities. Some other studies suggest 0.5 grams per kilo per hour. Yeah, no, definitely. It's definitely something um, that may need adjusting depending on like how vigorous the activity is, the duration, all of those different things. Okay. Um, so higher temperatures may increase insulin absorption and lower temperatures um, will decrease insulin absorption. So things like if you're thinking long distance swimming, it's just going to be cold. Um, those are some things that can also affect how well the insulin is being absorbed. And if the insulin isn't absorbed quite as well, then we may want to reconsider, um, you know, how much insulin we have on board and how we'll do with that activity. Um, let's see. And then the heat places additional stress on your cardiovascular system. So you could have more energy expenditure and the potential for more of a drop in your blood sugar levels as well. Okay. So, so there's been a lot of study on pumps and like removing your pump and seeing what happens during activity or like suspending your insulin delivery and all this stuff. So, so, so obviously, so if you're doing an activity where you like to just completely suspend the system, take a pump off, whatever it is, um, they usually say not to disconnect it for more than two hours because after that time, the insulin in your system has started to wear off. And so your ketone levels might start creeping up and you might end up getting in trouble. Okay. So 
you so a lot of times we don't like to completely you know if you're going to take it off one to two hours is usually reasonable then we want to put it back on sometimes if you have like kids that are swimmers maybe they swim for an hour you pop out you give them like half of their normal basal rate that they would have gotten during that time as a bolus and then let them pop back in and like swim some more or something like that um so so that's one one method of potentially um helping with that situation <clears throat> So, um, so again, patients may require a 50% bolus correction after, after the activity, if you've suspended their basal, um, basically 50% of that missed basal insulin, just to go ahead and give it to them at the end to help prevent that post-exercise hyperglycemia that can happen. Um, and then, uh, and then if you really, if you're like my kid's really prone to hypoglycemia or I'm really prone to hypoglycemia, you could consider suspending the insulin at least 60 minutes before so that when they start the activity, a lot of that insulin is worn off and you don't have as much insulin on board. Um, then you might do the activity with like, you know, 50% or, or like a regular basal rate. Um, but it may, it is another way that you could potentially prevent that hypoglycemia. All right. Um, yeah. So we said two hours. Um, and then if the pump is removed during exercise, you might have more hyperglycemia afterwards. Also, if you reduce the basal rate during the exercise, um, significantly that can also lead to more, um, post-exercise hyperglycemia. And so, um, so we talked about before doing a temporary basal rate, like 90 minutes before the activity of 50 to 80%, if you're really prone to that, um, low blood sugar, depending on the intensity and the duration, of course. Okay. <clears throat> So let me see. So if you have like short, intense exercise, um, that's like really, really like, like you're really trying your hardest, like greater than 80% VO2 max, that's going to lead to elevated catecholamine levels that your adrenaline, epinephrine and norepinephrine for about two hours after exercise in adults, your blood sugars may remain elevated for three to four hours. Um, even when the pre-exercise blood sugar was normal, post-exercise hyperglycemia lasted for two hours, post-exercise in pump patients. Um, and it may be exaggerated if the pump's been disconnected. So if you have more of these hormones that raise your blood sugar and you disconnected your pump, so you didn't get that basal insulin, it's like all of the things are adding together and it's just increasing that post-exercise spike. Um, so giving a small additional dose of rapid acting insulin halfway during the exercise or immediately after exercise um, can be helpful. All right. So then we are almost there. You guys We're almost there timing of exercise. So in the morning before you've had breakfast, that's when insulin states are usually pretty low. You may have a totally different response to exercise in the morning than if you exercise in the afternoon or evening. Okay. I totally do. It's like a completely different, um, schedule on the weekends and the gym's only open in the morning. I can't do what I do during the week at night. Um, it's, it's very, very different. So your circulating insulin levels are low. You may not need to reduce your basal rate as much prior to exercise or at all. Um, you really just kind of have to do some trial and error. Um, if you do exercise in the morning, it may help avoid that nocturnal hypoglycemia post-exercise. We don't see as much of that because you kind of have the whole day to like eat food and replenish your glycogen stores. And so, so you're in a better place at nighttime where, where you're not as prone to hypoglycemia. Um, and then for those of you with kids, there's lots of children that are active during the school day and in the afternoon or after school period. So it might be hard to minimize their exposure during these high insulin states. Um, it, but you can always like readjust their lunchtime or, or snack um, insulin doses to try and help prevent that. And um, younger children um, tend to have activity in unpredictable bursts. So, so if you're having, if you find it challenging, it's okay. Give yourself grace because it is, it is a challenge <laughs> and there's no perfection, um, with diabetes. So, um, ketone levels. So I'm going to give you the, the, the technical recommendations. They say, if your ketone levels are high, greater than 1.5, if you do the blood ketone check or they're like large, then usually they say exercise is contraindicated. I know some folks follow keto diets. Um, and that you're able to exercise safely with that. We just don't have data on it. So it's not a part of the recommendations. And today I'm giving like more official recommendations. Okay. Um, but I also hope that you enjoy this little, um, this little cartoon with the blood test strip and the ketone strip. Um, because the blood tester asks if they don't use blood to test, what do they put on you? And then the ketone strip says, you don't want to know. So that's fabulous. Uh, enjoy just something to make you happy. Um, 
there's always a possibility that you have elevated ketone levels for another reason. Like, Hey, you're sick. You caught something. Maybe your insulin pump isn't working. So it's always a good idea to, to check, I think. Um, and, and, it, and again, it's always possible that your ketone levels will rise during an activity. Um, you are burning a lot of energy and a lot of times you're burning fat. So um, the byproduct of burning fat is ketones. So the ketone levels may go up as you exercise and it, it may just be physiologic, but that's something to discuss on an individual basis with your provider, <laughs> um, especially if you do like a keto diet. <clears throat> Oh, a Frezza. Yeah. A Frezza does work really fast. Um, you, you definitely can use a Frezza and that could be helpful because it also doesn't stick around for nearly as long as, um, as like your injectable insulin. Um, so it has a shorter duration of action. So that's another great, that's a great pro tip. I'm going to add that to this presentation the next time I give it. Um, all right. This is just like a little, um, chart that chart that was made where like, what's your ketone level and should you exercise or not? If your blood sugars are high and you have high ketones, generally no. Um, cause it, in the setting of the high glucose and the high ketone levels, um, the ketone levels could potentially keep going up because you're going to make all those hormones that are going to make your blood sugars go higher and your ketone levels go higher. That's what they do. Um, so, so that's just, just something for you to know. Okay. Um, the other thing, just, just to point out, if you've had severe hypoglycemia, like you had mind altering hypoglycemia, you couldn't talk, somebody else needed to help you and get you something you need to use a glucagon. They really don't recommend physical activity for the next 24 hours because you're at such higher risk of hypoglycemia. Okay. And just so you know, if you have had hypoglycemia within the past 24 hours, um, especially below like 55, um, that's going to put you at higher risk of having, um, of having hypoglycemia during exercise because the hormones that help prevent that might be a little, they, they might not respond appropriately like they normally would. Um, if you hadn't had that, that hypoglycemia, um, let's see. Can I just jump in and ask you a quick question? Uh, one of yes, our had a severe issue with, um, extra IOB unexplained or un it happened. Um, his muscles hurt for two days after. Um, can you explain that? What happens to the, the tissues and muscles in your body with serious or severe hypoglycemia? I would actually have to look that up. Ooh. Um, this wasn't, this wasn't like a seizure. Like it, it didn't no. have a seizure and his muscles no. hurt and stuff. No. no. Uh, how, how long was the hypoglycemia? Um, I don't know, Carol, you're on, um, a couple hours. It was serious. It was, a, it was a couple of hours of hypoglycemia. I mean, it, I mean, it may just have something to do with like the glucose deprivation for that long of a period of time, but I, yeah. but it, it also may be something very individual. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't say for sure. Okay. Thank you. Hard to say. Yeah, I know. Sorry. I know. I wish I knew everything, but <laughs> We kind of think you do. I, I definitely don't, but I'm working on learning as much as I can. Um, all right. So, so complications in type one diabetes, you know, it's not, it's not uncommon to have, um, have complications and have issues that are going to present a barrier to physical activity. Okay. So, um, the still, we still do recommend like low intensity physical activities for folks, even if you have complications, like even proliferative retinopathy, nephropathy. So if you have kidney problems, um, we usually say avoid resistance-based exercise or anaerobic exercise. It's going to result in really high, um, blood pressures just because those high blood pressures can sometimes make those, um, those particular situations worse. But I do just want to say that, um, that we still do recommend low intensity physical activities. You want to go out on that paddle board. That's like, you know, it's not going to, it's not going to be like the most strenuous activity of all time. That sounds great. Go for walks, go for hikes. That all sounds wonderful. Um, maybe don't deadlift 300 pounds because that sounds like it's probably going to make things worse. So, um, so yeah, I just want to say, Ooh, people are talking about DCCT in the chat. I want to go look, but anyways, this is the majority of my talk, but then I also wanted to save time to answer questions. So, um, the main takeaways are your individual response to different types of exercise time of the day, all of these different things, um, that's going to vary. So, um, you should be aware of like these broad, 
themes that that can um, that can play a role in your your diabetes management. Individualizing it is really important for you for you. So the more pro tips you throw in the chat, the better, because the more we can learn from each other about what's working for them, the the better off we're going to be. Um, and it's a good idea to just, um, you know, know the things to pay attention to, to try to figure out exactly what's going to help you um, the most with your activity. And I will close with this picture of all of us on the top of Mount Whitney, um, which was so fun. Honestly, for each kid, I had a regimen where I was like, okay, if we're doing it, like you need a basal rate reduction of 50% and we can bolus 25% for your meals. I mean, like each person had their own little, like, like we eventually figured it out for each person, like how much they needed to reduce their meal boluses for and their basal rates for, and then how to adjust things overnight. It was so fun. Such a good time. Not a lot of sleep for the, <laughs> the folks managing the blood sugars, but, but it was a good time. So thank you all. Okay. Um, I'm going to pitch this out to Tina if she's got any questions. Otherwise, of course, I always have questions. Um, <laughs> let's get you onto the gallery so people can see. Um, I'm curious um, because, again, uh, the people that are of the extreme exercisers on here, God bless you, that's amazing. And uh, I probably used to do that in younger days. I don't do that now. Um, what keeps the regular non-intense people motivated to work this hard to figure this out. This is not simple math. This is not simple or regular outcomes. It, it's so variable. How do you motivate your young, your young kids other than they want to do their sports to really work hard for this? Um. Okay. So I will say, uh, we, we're actually, we're working on a research study. <laughs> so, um, I, it's not my study. This is, um, Garrett Ash. I think his, his study has been advertised in some of the groups. Um, but, uh, but we are doing an exercise study with, uh, with various different types of, uh, video games to try to get kids active. So in our research study, we're using Nintendo ring fit, um, virtual reality is another cool one, um, that I keep, telling him to try to include in the, in these things, but to try and get kids who aren't typically moving around very much moving around. Um, the younger ones, especially during the adolescent period, it's a, it's a totally different, um, uh, hormonal, it's a different hormonal environment. Okay. Because we've got really higher levels of growth hormone, um, compared to any other stage in our life. We've got these puberty hormones that the body's never seen before and is now adapting to. So like, there's a lot of other complicated factors that are going to play a role in, in pediatric exercise, especially during adolescence. Um, so, so, but to try to get folks active and stay a little bit more active, I think like every little bit counts, like even just like trying to take a 15 minute break at lunch to like clear your head and just like take a little walk around. Um, I think that's helpful. And a 15 minute walk might not, I mean, it might, but it might not cause a huge, you know, reduction in your blood sugar. So you might be able to just go for a little walk and then just like have some, have some, have something with you that you can treat yourself with if you need it, or if you feel like you're dropping the, the, the shorter activities, I think are, are going to be less complicated to manage. A lot of these other ones, I think be, that are more complicated come into play when, when we're doing at least like, you know, a 60 minute bout of exercise and, and our blood sugars are going to drop, or if we're like doing competitive sports and things like that, that where our blood sugars may rise, um, or doing competitive weightlifting, all these sorts of things, uh, they can, they can definitely, um, they, it can definitely get more complex the more you're doing. But I think as far as lighter activities go like walking or like a short jog or something like that, there's not as much that needs to be done necessarily beforehand, except for like, be prepared. And then if you notice a trend, every time I go for this 15 minute walk, my blood sugars drop, just have a snack before you go. And then you're all set, you know? Yeah. I'm going to ask Marion to jump on this one. Um, there, there's a question about, or she says she uses loop overrides, which work really well while looping and biking for a couple hours at a moderate pace. I come back with some negative IOB and I take that plus an hour of basil when I get home. Uh, and she also started doing ring fit. Uh, Join but, our study. Just kidding. Yeah. 
no, my, my five-year-old grandson was doing it and it looked fun. So my husband has a ring, I mean, a Nintendo Switch. So he bought a Ring Fit Adventure and now he's doing it too. I think we're both getting a lot of benefit from it. So but I'm just curious, uh, Marion, just so I understand what you said. Um, you come back with negative IOB and you take that plus an extra hour of basal? Right. So I, I override. I mean, loop would normally give me the negative IOB as soon as my blood sugar starts to rise, which it always does when I'm coming back from a bike ride. You know, I stop and blood sugar starts to go up. So loop would normally give me the negative IOB, but I'll override it and give a, about an hour's worth of basal in addition because I'm going to be eating in the next half hour or so. I, I go out before I eat. So is your, how long is your bike ride? A couple hours. Is it, yeah. And what do you do during the bike ride for your, um, your insulin level? I, I do about a uh, 75, no, a 70% override um, with a slightly higher range. So my range is normally 85 to 100. I pump it up to about 120 to 130. And uh, I, I tend to be in the hundreds, you know, the kind of low hundreds. If yeah. I drop much below 90, then I've got, you know, candy or whatever. I'll, I'll have a piece of candy. But and mostly so, I can go the whole ride without eating anything. Yeah. Um, and then, it, but you're reducing it by 70%. Your normal doses right. are reduced by 70%. Okay. So, yeah. So that means that, yeah, by the time you're done with that activity, if you're not exercising anymore and chewing up all that, that glucose, yeah. then you're going to need that insulin. So then that That's makes right. sense that yeah. the longer you reduce that basal rate, then you have to add a little bit on top of that to make up for lost time. Otherwise it's going to cause like a space. Yeah. So that, and, that makes perfect sense. And, it's a and I set the, I set the target about a half hour before I leave. So I've got a two and a half hour override that I start half hour before my bike ride. And when I get back, it's, it's just about right. Um, oh. Okay. Tina, I see a question from you. Um, yeah. Is it more advisable to give carbs and insulin during exercise or to deal with the negative effects of disconnecting afterwards or does it matter? No, I think it's, 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 it's a personal choice. I would say the only thing I would say is if you're, if like you're trying to combat like weight gain and stuff like that, then, then uh, avoid the carbs or, or I don't know for me personally, I don't like being interrupted by like, I got to drink a juice box. So that just like drives me nuts. And so I'm all about planning ahead of time to avoid that need during the activity and having to potentially stop. Um, so that's my personal decision. If, if weight isn't really an issue or anything like that, or let's say you're training for something, then like, then you can have the, the juice box. If, if you're annoyed by the post exercise spike, that's, that's totally, that's totally reasonable. So, and, uh, my 11 year old can go into, he's a swimmer and he can go into practice at a hundred and come out between 80 and a hundred, um, after an hour and a quarter of practice when he was on Nova log and we've switched him over to Fiasp and I'm finding he needs to be like below 0.2 and, um, and then he still okay. needs some carbs. Do you have any Not insight have into that? <laughs> Oh so wait, so what what happened when you switched sorry, what happened when you switched to Fiasco though? Like he he's been going low more and even even with less IOB when he starts swimming cuz he swims at 5ish yeah. in the afternoon. Okay. So it's kind of hard. Got it. Yeah, so and um and that's, that gets a little tricky too, because it, the FIASP is going to get, you know, it has niacin in there and that's potentially going to increase the absorption. So anything that increases the absorption is going to act like, you know, that you're going to get more insulin in your bloodstream essentially. So, um, so higher risk of, of low blood sugars. Um, and I'll cut, I'll cut, um, I'll, I'll actually open the loop ahead of time and I'll give him like maybe an hour ahead. I'll give him, um, some bait, you know, the equivalent of the basil that he would have gotten. So he's got it up front instead of getting it all along. Um, just to keep him from going, you know, high beforehand. Okay. And how, how long beforehand is he eating? Is it about an hour? Well, he, no, he has lunch at noonish and then he's got his, his fat and protein rise to deal with in the afternoon, you know? Yeah. I mean, the, the things, so even with like a teeny bit of insulin on board, he still drops though. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, he's like me, I, 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 a whiff of insulin and I'm just gonna, <laughs> um, 
Um, I mean, so, so I think, but it's, but you're giving him insulin right before he starts, you're giving him the basil before he starts so that he has it. He has it about, um, typically I'll do it about an hour before he starts and then I'll open the loop or I'll raise the, the target so that he's not getting any more insulin. And is it just he, that he rises before he starts the activity or? No. no. Okay. Mm -mm. I mean, it, I, I, I would, most of the time I've told folks to replace the basal insulin afterwards, but does he spike afterwards if he, if he doesn't get it? Okay. <laughs> yes. You can try yeah, it. And, and uh, my husband, well, he's the one that hangs out at the pool with him and he'll, he'll um, check his blood sugar a time or two during practice and he'll turn on basil and then even start bolusinum before the end of practice. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. It's arduous. Yeah. It's so hard. We, yeah. He's just very sensitive. He's very sensitive. So, yeah. so yeah, if you can give a bolus like 15 minutes before, you know, you're done, then it's kind of like, well, you'll have that buffer there. So, so, so it won't necessarily cause a low, but it'll help prevent the spike. That's, mm -hmm. that is something that some of my, my kids will end up doing. Um, I mean, if, if, if the full basil is too much, I would just like reduce it to a little bit less, but it sounds like it's just kind of unpredictable what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It is. And our goal is to move him towards being able to handle it without us intervening. You know, he's how old he's he'll be 12 soon. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I, I definitely think the, the kids are a little bit trickier because there's just so many things going on to grow in and like maturing and all this sort of stuff. So, um, I do think that can get a little more complex and, and less predictable. It, it is just going to be less predictable. Um, so just hang in there, <laughs> hang, hang in there. And like, you know, if a unit is too much that, or like if the full basil is too much, try half the basil, see how that goes. If there was like a different meal ahead of time and that plays a role or something, like, I don't know if there's, I, I, I don't exactly I don't have a good answer. It'd be a lot of trial and error. And like, we would work together and try to <laughs> try to figure yeah. it out. I'm going to jump in um, from Joe. Oh, go ahead. Um, he, he, um, could do two more questions. Um, and then we'll let you go. Cause it's late your time. Um, can you talk more about uh, muscle mass and body mass and intense exercise? Uh, I weigh one, 240. Uh, I might need, um, one to 118 insulin to carb ratio. But if I do four sets of deadlifts, I eat, 60, 80 carbs for free. Um, this can be make it challenging to plan activities since it sometimes require I eat a meal before exercise and or force blood sugars high for hours prior to suspending basil. Um, yeah, no, no, no. I did see that with the deadlifting. So with the deadlifting, okay. I, I was thinking when I first saw that, that I wonder how much insulin you have on board when you, you're starting. And is this like a consistent pattern? Or is this, is this just sometimes it, it drops a lot? And then th my other question would be like, as far as repleting glycogen, like post-exercise, like, is it possible that maybe like you didn't have all your glycogen stores repleted or you didn't like eat enough to keep up with that? And then that was more, made you more prone to the low blood sugar um, uh, you, during the activity? Me, I, I yes. Hi. Oh, hi, Joe. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good. Um, yes. Yeah, so I'll try to clarify a little bit more. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm a, like avid weightlifter, uh, yeah. I lift like five, six, seven days a week. Um, and I'm just kind of curious, yeah, like yeah. more about like relationship with like muscle mass or body mass. Cause I'm like a bigger guy. Yeah. Like, like, I don't know what's normal. I'll be sitting at my desk doing work all day and I feel like I need a lot of insulin. Um, but then if I go to exercise, that's what throws my whole day off. Um, because like I said, I might need to have like a whole cup of rice, just so I don't go low. And like, all I'm doing is like four sets of five reps for deadlifts or something. Yeah. But no, I do think you have a lot more muscle mass. So then a lot more glucose receptors that can potentially, um, use that up. And it, I mean, do, are you, do, are, do you usually take insulin within two to three hours of it? Not normally because a lot of times like okay. I've experimented with two different ways, one where you either suspend insulin for like an hour or two before, um, or I just like, eat a meal basically without giving myself insulin right prior to exercise. Okay. Um, and, and basically whatever happens is I kind of end up doing like roller coaster and chasing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I would, I, I probably wouldn't do like a, 
I really don't like to like not give insulin before, um, you know, like I wouldn't, you might need to find something in between is, mm-hmm. is the thing I think. Um, it's like, like, you know, if you've tried the suspension and that didn't work, try 50% reduction, see if that helps. I mean, it's really just, you start with one and then you just sort of like adjust from there, like start with one method and, and then adjust from there. The other thing that, that sometimes I find um, helpful is like a protein snack prior to exercise, or even if you just did like a shake, you know, like a protein shake prior to exercise. Cause I do think that, um, maybe like an hour before that can kind of help steady things out a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I, I'm I, doing I that a lot. Very, very high, like protein intake. So I'm pretty much always eating protein. Um, <laughs> Wait, yeah. can I share, can I share how much I can deadlift? Like, okay. That, okay. Does anybody want to guess? I'm five foot seven and I weigh 165 pounds. Does anybody oh, want to wow. guess how much I can deadlift? 250. 425. No, not 425. Come on. That's not realistic. I'm not like, who's that, that would girl? have been impressive. <laughs> 350. No, no, no. 293. I'm trying to get to 300. Okay. That's like my goal. Yeah. Trying to get to 300. That's I'm almost amazing. There. That's 265. <laughs> that's amazing just, okay so anyways i just wanted to share because that that's like my little goal <laughs> we are totally impressed. i'm coming for you joel i'm coming for you <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm just curious about that because like also like I'm, i don't mean to take up all your time but like i can also like sometimes i'll go um i guess like rocking we call it like i put like a 30 pound 40 pound weight in a backpack and go walking yes that will absolutely tank my blood sugar too yes I even feel yeah. like it's hard i'm just going for a walk my blood sugar might be like 280 and i come home and i'm 120 yeah um, exactly exactly yeah so is it if it, it, it's a more vigorous like w- like aerobic activity essentially when you do that um so it's it's gonna lo- drop your sugars more dramatically for sure um when we were backpacking we had like each of us had like 40 pound weights in there and like and if it wasn't uh, so so I would ad- so the weight was always there but I would adjust it based on uphill if you're going uphill it's going to drop you more than if you're going on flat if you're putting weight in the bag it's going to drop you more than if you're just like walking on flat ground without the weight those sorts of things so you, so those are some of the things to take into consideration too but I, I I'm not surprised but it I mean I think it's good that like you're very sensitive to insulin that's always a healthy thing so Butch has a question. What? I have one yeah, more question. Hey. And this or is Butch has a comment too. Okay, yeah. Butch, Butch, I, you know, I'm the guy who's been making the comments about uh, adrenaline and things and various situations. I just wanted to thank you very much and tell you it's so much better now. 36 years ago, I rode my bicycle from San Diego to Washington, D.C. in three weeks, averaging 140 miles a day, taking pork insulin, regular, and NPH and urine test strips and i managed now it's Bless all you. <laughs> Amazing. i can't even imagine nph oh my god yeah Sorry. It's, it's different anyway thank you NPH and biking all day no it just sounds it just sounds like it's gonna be a disaster i was on nph as a kid <laughs> yeah well, a no, well, here's, here's, well i won't take up your time but the worst case was when there was a 20 mile an hour tailwind. My insulin had gone bad in the heat in Arizona. Oh, and no, the no, doctor no. in the in the Indian reservation wouldn't give me more insulin until she examined me and I lost the wind for two hours. Anyway, okay. thank you. <laughs> Do, if you have anything that you'd like to add, I wasn't able to get to everything in the chat. Honestly, I saw a lot of stuff come up. But if you have any other tips that you want to add... There's yeah, just one. And yes, um, you can also send it to me on a private message and I will include it on the list of questions that I'll post and send to you, um, Laura. So question about, this is off topic, um, but you're an endo, we get to talk to you. Yeah. Uh, DCCT, DCCT trial and the new systems that are out that we've heard enough times that um, it's almost impossible to get a child to have an A1C under 6.6. We don't agree with that. Um, and also it isn't that big a deal. And I, and and I see that Jim McIver, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, talked about the, um, study in Sweden. Um, but is there actually a current actual study about, um, either, the development of new complications or the exacerbation of current complications, depending on where your blood sugar is. Uh, the, the, the gold standard that we have is the DCCT. 
um, which was eight blood sugar checks throughout the day, you know, like it, it, it yeah, I know it's a very different time. Um, they say that they're not going to redo the DCCT with CGMs or anything like that. I don't know why, why wouldn't you do that? You should do that. <laughs> but, well, I, I'd be okay if they didn't do it, but they're quoting information from 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I've been thinking, can't, can't we do that? Like, well, we can't, we can't be a valid information without. Yeah. You data. have to do it. Like everybody does it the yeah. same and all the, all these things. Um, but wait, I, I, so we don't have any data to show that like, you know, 6.6 .6 versus seven and is, is necessarily any, any better, but like it's also individual because there are individuals that I will see get complications with like A1Cs in the eight to 9% range. And then I will see individuals with 14% A1Cs for years, not get complications. And it's just, you know, you just don't know, like each person probably has some individual risk. So by minimizing the risk and trying to get as close to normal as you can without going, you know, going nuts because like you could go nuts um, or like, you know, depriving yourself of wonderful things in life. And, you know, you try to get it as close as you can to that range to like basically what non-diabetic range is without having too many lows and without, you know, giving, sacrificing like everything there is in life, you know? We, we understand that we're the outliers in this whole world of taking care of yourself. We, yeah, we will work hard and, we're very aware of our A1Cs and our time and range, and we care, to, and we do that. But it seems scary to hear that it's okay. And I understand who it's targeted to, but just as frustrating, because we just want to be able to set our targets. It, we'll use your systems, but it doesn't seem like that will even be something they'll consider. Yeah, because of, because of the data and stuff like that that they have, right? I, I mean, honestly, when when I talk to folks, I'm like, it, it, like I don't mind if your A1C is like five point five or six, as long as like you're happy and you're not having like hypoglycemia every night, you know, like like that's fine. Um, but yeah, as far as the technology and what they're marketing, it, it, yeah it's it, and honestly, for pregnant women, just forget it. I mean, they're supposed to stay like sixty five to one forty all day. There's like, there's no technology that can do that. There's only the looping systems where you get to set it yourself. So, um, yeah, know that. Yeah. So thank you for listening. Um, yeah, thank, of you, course. thank you for your time tonight. Uh, people have been so excited. I'm getting messages and, and we want you to come back of course. Um, but thank you. And I will send you all the questions that we had. If there's anything else it, you see out there that you want to jump up to Mary and said, aside from complications, I just plain feel mm. better with a normal. Yeah. Right. Body. And that's what we've gotten used to. Um, yeah. So then that's, that's important and that's important to you and you're able to do it. So that makes sense. I know I, it, I do think the technology will come along eventually and make it more individualized. I know that there is a push for that, but it's just, it's not, it's not here yet, unfortunately. So. We just keep bringing it up. Well, that's what we'll do. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so, so very much. Uh, you have a wonderful evening. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for making this as clear as you did, um, listening to everybody's questions. And we appreciate it. We will absolutely invite you back, please. Yeah, thanks, everybody, for coming. All right, thank you so much. Thank thanks, you. Joanne. Thanks, Laura. Fabulous. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.